Ireland is an unbelievably beautiful country with some of the most impressive and stunningly picturesque landscapes anywhere on earth. But it is also an ancient land, richly steeped in tradition, history, mythology and legends. This is the first episode in a new series which aims to explore these legends whilst also uncovering the darker side of Irish folklore. So to begin, we are going to be discussing one of Ireland's most iconically eerie locations, Dublin's Hellfire Club. So turn out the lights, lock your doors and let's get started. Perched atop the foothills of the Dublin mountains on Mount Pellier's Hill overlooking the city, the Hellfire Club is an oppressive and forbidding looking edifice. But how exactly did such an intimidating looking establishment come to be built and for what purpose? Well, the origins of the Hellfire Club begin with William Connolly, an extremely wealthy lawyer, landowner and politician from Donegal. Born in 1662, Connolly amassed his vast wealth from land transfers throughout his lifetime and used this immense fortune to purchase thousands of acres of land, whilst also commissioning numerous large-scale building projects. One of Connolly's many land purchases included Mount Pellier Hill, which he purchased from the debt-ridden first Duke of Wharton in 1723, but we'll get back to this Duke later. Connolly subsequently commissioned the construction of a small hunting lodge at the summit of the hill in 1724, and it was to be designed in the Palladian architectural style which was extremely popular at the time. Mysteriously however, no one knows who actually designed the lodge in the first place, as no record of the architect's identity is known to exist. Before construction of Connolly's Lodge could commence however, an otherworldly obstacle would have to be overcome. You see, on the summit of Mount Pellier Hill, near the proposed construction site, there already lay the ruins of an ancient Neolithic passage grave, possibly dating back over 5,000 years. This burial mound was also topped by a stone cairn which was then disrespectfully removed before construction began. But in a further slide to the dead buried there, the workers were also instructed to incorporate stones from the removed cairn in the construction of the lodge's new fireplace. This led many amongst the locals to believe that the building was now tainted or cursed, haunted by the spirits of the dead right from the very beginning. And these beliefs were soon borne out as on the exact same night that the lodge's construction was complete, a heavy thunderstorm suddenly formed as if out of nowhere, blowing the lodge's newly built slate roof right off the mountain in a freak weather event. Many superstitious locals soon began theorizing that it was in fact the devil that had caused the roof to be blown off as revenge for the desecration of the ancient tomb there. Connolly was unmoved by these supposed supernatural events and immediately ordered a new roof made from stone to be constructed on top of the lodge. This stone roof added much to the structural strength of the lodge, but also unintentionally gave the building a uniquely dark and unsettingly sinister appearance. The lodge was finally finished in 1725 and housed a kitchen, servants quarters, two stables flanking either side of the building, two reception rooms and finally guest sleeping quarters located on both the upper and ground floors. Notwithstanding its harsh exterior, the interior of the lodge was said to be extremely luxurious and elegant, catering to the needs of high class aristocrats and indeed the very wealthy elite of Irish society. And despite the apparent air of affluence however, upon completion the lodge was still unable to shake its coarse reputation and simply became known locally as Connolly's Folly and far more bluntly the Haunted House. Even so, many guests ignored the lodge's more ungodly associations and still visited regularly in the intervening years. The lodge's main use was also rumoured to have been as a meeting place for Irish Freemasons, but soon the lodge would become home to new more permanent tenants. Tenants from an association that the building now owes its namesake to, the Hellfire Club. The original Hellfire Club was founded in 1718 in England by Philip, first Duke of Wharton, the very same Duke of Wharton who would go on to sell Mount Pellier Hill to William Connolly. Wharton founded an exclusive gentleman's club as an outlet for his excessive drinking, gambling, womanising and many other vices, later dubbing it the Hellfire Club. The club's infamy soon spread far and wide across the country until it was then forced to disband by the King of England, George I, in 1721. After the disbandment of Wharton's Hellfire Club, he would then go on to join another elite organisation, the Freemasons, in 1722. And, as it happens, one of his fellow Freemasons would then later go on to establish the first Irish Hellfire Club. 
That Freemason was Richard Parsons, 1st Earl of Ross and Grand Master of the Irish Grand Lodge of Freemasons. Despite his titles, Parsons was disinterested in politics, preferring to indulge in drinking, gambling and blaspheming. So, like Wharton, Parsons along with Anglo-Irish painter James Worsdale decided to start their own version of the Hellfire Club in 1737. The new Hellfire Club initially held its meetings at the Eagle Tavern in Dublin and its members consisted of many well-known poets, painters and politicians. Eventually, the club relocated to Connolly's Lodge on Mount Pellier Hill as it was far more secluded and private but also because club members were extremely eager to become associated with the already infamously cursed hunting lodge. The club soon established its own traditions, from having a black cat as a mascot to even leaving a place at the table for the devil to attend meetings. But soon, as in England, rumours began to spread of the club and of its members' more immoral activities. Rumours ranging from animal sacrifices, black masses, satanic rituals and even packs with the devil were rampant amongst the local population. And it was then that Connolly's Hunting Lodge finally gained its current title, the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club continued to be active at the lodge for a number of years until a fire suddenly broke out one night, heavily damaging the building and nearly killing many of the club members. The cause of the fire is still a mystery to this day, but as the lodge was now almost unusable, it led club members to relocate their meetings to the nearby Killikey Stewart's house. The Hellfire Club lingered on for a few years longer before finally disbanding sometime in the 1740s. However, the club's legacy would live on throughout the centuries in stories and local urban legends. One of these urban legends involved Hellfire Club member and politician Simon Luttrell, whose nickname was fittingly the King of Hell, and was said to be a prolific gambler and womanizer. The story goes that one night whilst drinking in the Hellfire Club, Luttrell supposedly settled all of his crippling gambling debts by making a pact with the devil, offering his soul to him seven years hence. And indeed, after seven years had passed, the devil made good on their bargain, returning to the club to claim the trail's soul. The devil entered and threatened the club members, informing them that the last man out of the room would have their soul taken. The men all rushed to the door in a blind panic, leaving the trail as the last man inside. As the devil slowly approached him, the trail had to act fast and somehow managed to distract the devil just long enough to dart out of the club, barely escaping with his life and soul intact. Another one of the club's legends involves a Catholic priest who came to the Hellfire Club late one night whilst investigating the disappearance of a local parishioner. Upon entering the club, the priest is said to have found the club members in the process of worshipping a large black cat with horned ears. The panicked priest luckily had a small bottle of holy water and quickly splashed it on the possessed creature to immediately begin performing an exorcism. The animal thrashed around violently, lashing out at the priest until finally the demon was forcibly released. Lastly, we have the most famous and well-known story from the Hellfire Club. It is said that on one stormy night, members of the Hellfire Club were playing cards when suddenly they heard three large bangs on the club's heavy wooden door. The men opened the door and were met by a mysterious, cloaked stranger. A stranger who just so happened to have a lot of money. The stranger was quickly invited in from the storm and joined the men at the card table and began to play. During the game, one of the club members accidentally dropped one of their cards on the floor and upon bending down to pick it up, to his horror, he saw that the mysterious stranger had cloven hooves in place of feet. The club member silently resumed playing cards, sweating and terrified, until some time later he finally lost his nerve and shouted out what he had seen. The mysterious stranger pointed and laughed mockingly at him before bursting into flames and vanishing. The club member then suddenly dropped dead at the table in front of the rest of the terrified men. Today, the Hellfire Club is a popular local tourist attraction and is also part of a hiking and walking trail. However, there are controversial plans to build a visitor center with a cafe and treetop walkway nearby. But the plans have been met with much opposition from locals and also the archaeological community who want to protect the passage grave and history located there. But no matter what happens, the Hellfire Club is still an imposing and iconic part of Dublin's history and lore and it will continue to live on and haunt us all for centuries to come. Thanks for watching and if you found this topic as intriguing as I did, don't forget to drop a like and remember to subscribe if you want to see more intriguing content like this in the future.